So I'm going to start off uh, <clears throat> with a question for all of you. When you go to see your physician, how many of you go into the office thinking, well, how is that doctor that I'm seeing today educated? What is their background? Do I know what their test scores were during medical school? Do I know that <clears throat> they really had an experience during medical school that I would think would be adequate and feel, make me feel comfortable that I'm getting the care that I want to get? How many of you have actually walked into the office thinking that? You may know where that person graduated, but do you really know how they were educated? You probably don't. And so what I hope to show you is that as medical educators, we actually take that idea very seriously to ensure and make sure that you have trust that when you are seeing a physician, that you can feel assured that that person is not only competent, but also is going to ultimately deliver a healthcare outcome that you're going to be satisfied with. So I want to maybe show you a little bit of how that journey occurs, a little bit underneath the hood about how that happens. But I also want you to think about how daunting an idea that is. If you think about <clears throat> what we start with, which is really people coming into medical school who make our job easier as educators. They're incredibly bright, they're gifted, they're motivated, they're engaged, but they also come from very diverse backgrounds. They have different values, beliefs, and they have different career aspirations. A person who wants to be a cardiothoracic surgeon is very different inherently than somebody who wants to be a psychiatrist. And we're generally educating a wide spectrum of people with those diverse backgrounds. In addition, there's a huge body of knowledge that has to be gained. That's just the basic fact. Give you an example of that. There's over 250 chemotherapeutic agents that treat cancers. 50 of those agents have actually come on the market in the last two years. So your physician has to have that knowledge and has to be able to keep up with that knowledge in a way that actually improves your care. So how do we do that? Well, in medical education, we've gone through many different permutations, I think, of trying to make sure that we prepare people adequately for practice. And I think there's some imperatives that we traditionally think about. So <clears throat> we have to really, at a baseline, make sure that a physician is competent and has a core knowledge. And we have to make sure that the advances in scientific and clinical learning, those things are translated, and that we give people the skills that fundamentally can keep up with all those changes on a very active basis. We also have to make sure, and increasingly, clinical care is really collaborative and team-based. That's a skill that not all people have inherently and have to learn. Some people are very good at that. Other people really value their own autonomy and really want to operate really as a siloed individual and make all the decisions. That typically doesn't work today in healthcare. We certainly have public expectations for accountability and competence, and I'm going to come back to that. But that's incredibly important. You have to have trust that we're training and producing a product that's going to improve outcomes. We have a new generation of learners with new expectations. People's learning styles have changed. <clears throat> in my day, I was more than happy to sit in a lecture hall for hour upon hour, go back to my room at night and read a textbook. That's not so true anymore. There's new requirements for licensing bodies. Those requirements are very real and ones that we as educators have to meet. And then finally, physicians are judged not just on what we know, but what we can do and how we do it. So we have to begin to think about all of those things. Now, at the University of Virginia, <clears throat> probably about a decade ago, we realized that the curriculum, our real focus, our, our roadmap to training had to change. We recognized that for all of the reasons that I showed you on the prior slide, the world was changing and we needed to change how we educated our students so that they would be prepared to be the best physicians that they could possibly be. So we wanted to have a clinical <clears throat> relevant curriculum. We wanted to make sure that first and fo foremost that people were well trained, that they had a strong basis in clinical science. 
But we also wanted to make sure that they could integrate the basic science that we were teaching them to really translate that into the bedside. And also, we wanted to prepare people that could take that basic science, those new discoveries, and really improve the human condition. We wanted to make sure that that was there and palpable. We wanted to make sure that teaching was active and adopted to new learning styles. We wanted to make sure that we were teamwork and collaborative based. I'm going to talk about Bloom's taxonomy, but essentially we wanted to take the learning that had traditionally been very passive in medical schools, the lecture, reading, really on your own, to more of an active basis. We wanted to have continuous clinical skill development. I'm going to come back to that. And then we wanted to have assessments that were more, more real-life based. We wanted to put students in situations that really mimicked what they were going to encounter in clinical practice and show us that they were competent in those clinical scenarios that really recapitulated what they were going to have to do in real life. And then we wanted to again show that we observed those core competencies to make sure that they were clear. And that gets added a concept that's relatively new in medical education, which is the idea of an entrustable activity that you as a patient have entrusted me as an educator to make sure that a student is competent in producing a task. That task may be taking your history and making sure that that student is competent and can take that history in a very accurate way and get the information that they need to make a correct diagnosis. So you've entrusted me to make sure that that student is competent and I need to be able to demonstrate that in a way that's observed and structured to ensure that that activity can occur. <clears throat> so this is Bloom's taxonomy, and this is really the foundation of how we view, how we want to educate our students. And at the bottom are those activities that are relatively passive. We really want to get students up to the ability that they can evaluate and synthesize complex information and make the correct decision on a reliable basis. And so we want to move students from a more passive to a more active status. So how do we do that? <clears throat> well, over a period of about a decade, a large group of faculty members at the university really developed what we call the next generation curriculum. This curriculum is nothing <clears throat> that's unique to the University of Virginia. We were one of the first to adopt this type of structure. But this is now pretty much the basis of most medical schools, at least in the United States, and I think probably also in most of the Western world as well. Now, this is too small for you to see, but I want to highlight some things. This is just what sort of the map of that curriculum looks like. The first 18, 18 months or so of the curriculum is really more of a didactic foundational base where the students are learning by a systems-based technique, which really means by organ systems, cardiovascular system, renal system, <clears throat> immunology. They're really learning the basics, the clinical underpinnings, the basic science. But that's also supplemented by courses in social issues in medicine, by other things that round out their education that traditionally had not really been incorporated into many medical education curriculum. After that 18 months, students then get immersed in more of a clinical environment where they're actually learning by doing, by being much more involved in clinical activities. So I can tell you that there is a lot of resistance to change. Medical education um, <clears throat> is something that people have very strong feelings about. And uh, so moving a curriculum is something that takes a long period of time and requires a huge amount of engagement because ultimately you're requiring on the faculty to really change the way that they're teaching and interacting with students. And that can be very, very difficult. And people have very ingrained thoughts about that. So what we tried to do is really move to active learning. This began in 2014. And now more than about 70, 80% of all the education that our medical students receive is in an active form. And that typically includes team-based learning, and I'll show you what that looks like, case-based learning, problem sets, laboratories, using clinical cases and simulations, and finally, more active lectures. 
And we have some of our products in the room, hopefully. Our, we have four medical students and a resident who probably can speak to really how this feels, certainly better than I can. But I think this is a much more active, engaged process that also, I think, recapitulates what we really expect them to do as physicians when they graduate. Now, why active learning? Again, this gets back to that Bloom's taxonomy. And really what you want to do is move again from more passive to more active activities. And it's interesting for someone like myself who would be more used to giving a traditional lecture, what I hear from our students is oftentimes we tape these lectures. We make them available as sort of podcasts. And the first year that we did this, we all thought this was the greatest thing in the world, that students would have this vast array of <coughs> taped material of our lectures. What a gold mine that would be. Well, when I asked students what they actually did with those lectures, many of them told me what they would do is actually, while exercising, they would play my lecture back <coughs> at twice the speed on their, uh, their device, and they would get through a 30-minute lecture in about 15 minutes while exercising. Not exactly what I had anticipated, but it works. And I just think it gets to the sense that learning styles are very different and really have evolved quite a bit. So we also use observed structured uh, examinations. These are really objective, observable, measured <coughs> activities where we ask students to perform certain tasks. We're monitoring and observing them. They typically occur in clinical contexts that are real and recapitulate an event that we think that they'll be exposed to and it allows us to evaluate their skills. And this is really critical, I think, in terms of improving and allowing us to make sure that these are entrustable activities. So again, what we really want to do is going from knowing to doing. And so <clears throat> one of the things that really, I think, was instrumental as we devised this curriculum is really thinking about what that space would look like. How can we design a space that would facilitate this new type of teaching? And we were very fortunate that we devised, we were working on this new curriculum at the same time that we had an opportunity to build a new building that would be used for education. So those things occurred at the same time. And really, I think, thanks to our university leadership and some really significant foresight, they really allowed those things to occur with some synthesis. So we developed what we really call a learning space. <clears throat> the first people who were in the building, this was a common thing, they would say the building is not designed for teaching. It really wasn't designed for classical teaching. But we would argue that it was designed for learning. And so let me show you what the space looks like and how it was designed. And so we really aligned the design of the learning space with really what that curriculum design was intended to do. So this is the building, it's the Claude Moore Education Center. The first floor is what we call a learning studio. The second floor is a lecture hall. The lecture hall is a typical standard lecture hall. But then there's other spaces in the building. There's a medical simulation center, which I'll show you in a second. And then there's a clinical skills center in the basement level as well. And then there's offices as well, and as well as meeting spaces for the students. So this was a very deliberate process in design. And this is what the team-based learning activity looks like in that learning studio. And I'll show you a better picture of it. But what you can see is that there's a series of round tables with about 10 to 12 students at each table working together in a team-based activity that really simulates perhaps a clinical case or a scenario that they are working together in a collaborative team-based way to solve the problem and really leveraging all of their skills and background, which can be quite diverse at any given table, to solve and really bring forward to a clinical problem. <clears throat> the building also includes a medical state-of-the-art simulation center. If you're a patient, I am assuming that this will be the case, you would prefer probably not to have a third-year medical student practice by putting a central line in you. That had been prior to maybe a decade or so ago, been the standard practice. In a simulation center, we are allowing students with a relatively high fidelity 
to really simulate activities, procedures, clinical scenarios that can be quite complex, and to work together to solve those. And this simulation center is really quite high fidelity. That's what it looks like. There's a control center where different simulations can be uh, put forward and the students asked to solve them. And you can see there's Dr. Littlewood there, an anesthesiologist who is proctoring some students, going through the process and debriefing after the simulation. There's a clinical skills center, which is essentially sort of a mini office where students can participate and observe structured clinical examinations. There's meeting spaces. And this is what the learning studio looks like. It's really, I think, a beautiful space that's really facilitated by having a lecturer or a facilitator in the center. These rooms, these tables around where groups are really processing and working together to solve clinical uh, scenarios, cases, or other uh, problems. So you can see how really that space facilitates really what we think is really a new paradigm in education, which is really a more of a team-based, collaborative approach where we're really asking people to be much more active in clinical decision-making rather than passive and just receiving a whole bunch of knowledge. So that's, again, this clinical uh, learning studio in action. <clears throat> that's just a typical standard auditorium. And then, again, there's small group study areas <clears throat> but you can see most of the space is designed so that people really aren't isolated, that they're really working in groups together. And that's really very um, deliberate on our part, really to create those spaces that people have to be together. So <clears throat> this is a quote, whether you're designing a course, a curriculum, or a learning space, begin with the end of mind. We were fortunate that we had that opportunity. We began with an end in mind, which was a goal of how we envisioned the changes in medical education. And then we were able to work to help design a space that really facilitated that team-based learning. And so again, that's the building. And uh, thank you for your attention. <clears throat>